Bueno, buenas tardes, gracias a todos por venir. Como quizás algunos de vosotros sepáis, esta presentación tiene lugar dentro de lo que ha sido un proyecto largo, ya de unos cuantos meses de colaboración entre la EOI y Media Lab Prado, en relación a una de las líneas de investigación de Media Lab Prado, que es Visualizar. Visualizar es un programa que investiga de alguna manera las implicaciones culturales, eh, sociales, políticas, económicas y artísticas de lo que podríamos llamar la cultura de los datos, el hecho de que disponemos cada vez de estructuras de información más extensas y más complejas sobre eh, cada vez un número mayor de procesos y de qué manera podemos generar una cultura, eh, tanto una cierta alfabetización en entender las implicaciones de esas estructuras de información como unos nuevos códigos, unos nuevos lenguajes para entenderlos. Y dentro de estos nuevos lenguajes y códigos, obviamente, quizás el que ha adquirido una mayor relevancia es el de la visualización, el de conseguir, de alguna manera, a través de la eh, traducción visual de estructuras de información, de generar un sentido de comprensión, un sentido también de, de empoderamiento y de, y de elevar las capacidades comunicativas y cognitivas uh, que yacen en la información a gran escala en ese estado más abstracto. En estos momentos, Está teniendo lugar el taller de desarrollo de proyectos en Minera Prado eh, vinculado con el programa Visualizar. Hay 10 equipos con unas 60 personas de todo el mundo trabajando en el desarrollo de 10 prototipos de proyectos eh, desde hace algo más de dos semanas eh, y que presentarán públicamente este jueves, el jueves por la tarde, en la presentación final de proyectos a la que estáis todos invitados. Y junto al taller hemos tenido eh, toda una serie de actividades, hemos tenido mini talleres, hemos tenido un simposio inaugural Uh, y también hemos tenido pequeñas actividades a cargo de los profesores que pasan por el taller, que trabajan con los grupos en el desarrollo de los proyectos y que son, tengo la suerte de poder decir, algunos de los uh, expertos uh, de mayor renombre, de mayor importancia a nivel internacional en el ámbito de la visualización de datos como una cultura emergente. Y hoy tenemos con nosotros a alguien que, además de ser profesor en esta última etapa del taller, la última semana, creo que es uno de los grandes divulgadores y uno de los grandes exploradores de la cultura de la visualización de la información y de sus aplicaciones en muchos ámbitos y de cómo este nuevo ámbito de creación surge en un espacio intermedio a medio camino entre la empresa, la tecnología, la industria, el diseño y el arte y, eh, y en el que se implican profesionales de todos estos campos. Eh, Andrew Van de Moor, que es eh, profesor de la Universidad de Leuven en, en Bélgica, es desde hace eh, bastantes años ya, how many years since you started in prosthetics? Uh, 2004, so seven years. Desde hace unos siete años, el editor de un blog que es probablemente el, el, el archivo más uh, extenso y más conocido, la mayor comunidad uh, en Internet dedicada a la visualización de datos. Estoy hablando de Information Aesthetics, uh, infoesthetics.com. Creo que prácticamente cualquiera que haya sentido algún interés por la visualización alguna vez ha acabado acudiendo a esta inmensa fuente de información. Y a mí me gusta especialmente el papel de estos bloggers que son eh, no solamente eh, archivistas, no solamente se dedican a catalogar y a guardar y a preservar mucha información, sino también a generar una comunidad de usuarios por el simple hecho de detectar cosas que están pasando, de mostrarlas y hacerlas comprensibles y, y divulgativas. Eh, y esto es lo que ha sido Information Aesthetics a lo largo de todos estos años. Creo que, no me equivoco, sigo que es uno de los pilares fundamentales de una comunidad que es fuertemente internacional y fuertemente transdisciplinar. Uh, y cualquiera que tenga interés en entender uh, más acerca de las implicaciones de la visualización de información y la visualización de datos como una práctica en todos los ámbitos, uh, no podría empezar por un mejor sitio que por informationesthetics.com para entenderlo. Uh, y creo que lo que Andrew uh, nos tiene que contar hoy uh, es una buena manera de entender cuál es el estado actual después de los siete años de InfoStetic, pero también casi al menos diez años de práctica creativa importante alrededor de este medio. So, thanks a lot, Andrew, for being here with us. Yeah, well, thank you for inviting me. All right. So, I think he explained it very well. I don't have to really introduce myself anymore. This is the blog he was talking about, infostatics.com, um, where I try to collect projects that have to do with representations of data um, that are somehow unique in terms of exploration, in terms of, of bringing in, in, um, the field a bit further. So, it's, you will see the most of the project that I will also show you today. Uh, it's not about data visualization you know, as a scientific field, a computer science field, which really deals with complex data. But I'm trying to look for symbiosis between design and art and data visualization and see, um, you know, what the potential is there and even how that could bring science further or the other way around, you know, that science has a lot of good methods there that, that maybe designers could use for their goals. 
Normally, to can kind of have a, the, the same um, fundament, I showed this uh, definition of data visualization. There are many different uh, definitions around. I just made a few things yellow. I don't really want to teach you, but I want maybe to go for a specific keywords. It must be computer supported, so we have to have algorithms. But it must be interactive as well. And interaction is often sort of misunderstood as being, OK, I have to add buttons. I have to be able to somehow engage with it. But the reason why the interaction is there is, is to allow people to come up with questions, questions that you as a designer of the visualization cannot beforehand really estimate. You want to leave that open. And it's often that during the exploration for patterns, for trends, that you come up with new questions, with, with new hypotheses. And you want to test whether that is true or not. And to make that possible, that's why you need um, interaction. It should be visual. We can talk about that as well. And I guess the core of, of visualization is that the data is abstract. It means that the data has no physical counterpart. Uh, it's not about pictures of clouds, but it's about temperature. Temperature is a, is a number, a number that we invented as, as human beings, but a number does not have any physicality in that. So you can represent uh, a number by uh, color, temperature by color. You could have an icon. You could have shapes. You can actually add any sort of metaphor to uh, a value that has no physical counterpart. And that's sort of the, the, the challenge. And also, I think, the, the exciting part uh, for designers to create visualizations. And the main goal for visualization is what is called amplify cognition. It's kind of a difficult word to just state. It must bring some sort of knowledge. It must bring insight. That's sort of the, the goal. And you, and you will see when I show you some examples that are more artistic, we can sort of maybe discuss whether that really brings forward some insight, some, some knowledge. Um, and I'll try to pinpoint some, some of those things. But that's sort of the, the main. Um, let's say, a border between science and art to kind of solve this question. Now, there are different kinds of data visualization. And I'll try to give you some um, showing different categories with the same data set, which is DNA. So DNA, we have all this information in each of our cells. We have all this information stored, which is basically very unique, which is actually a representation of, of yourself in an abstract way, all the functions, all the instructions, how to build up the, the cells. You can visualize it in this way, which is basically if you would have a microscope uh, powerful enough, then the DNA will look like this. It's a scientific visualization. It comes very close to computer graphics. You want to have the shadows, and you want to have it as close as possible to reality. We can look to uh, the different functions in data uh, in DNA, and you can look at different enzymes and, and the composition of that. And often, this is represented by data graphics. If you talk about data visualization, most people will think that is data visualization. Pie charts, bar charts, uh, line graphs, and stuff like that. Um, but there are different kinds. You could try to think about making stories out of um, data. For instance, what you could see in newspapers or magazines, which we could call uh, infographics, which, for instance, here tries to show you how DNA is replicated. It's not really interactive. It's a story that the designer tries to convey to you. If you have other questions, well, you will have to go to Wikipedia or some other source to, to, to find that. Now, real data visualization is sort of that, um, that abstract data, but leaving these questions open. This is, for instance, one. Uh, gene and it's mapped in a in a circle and when there is some functional relationship between parts of the gene, it's com it's it's just um, connected with these lines. And what you can kind of see, for instance, <coughs> that, that um, a specific part of that gene looks like you know, um, I'll show it here. It looks like a <coughs> sort of um, the pilot uh, steering the rest of of that genetic makeup um, of that specific gene. Now I'm not an expert in genetic things, so I can't really explain what it is, but I, I guess you can. Understand that this functionality is something abstract, and the only way how you can, as a researcher, try to engage with it is to make it visual, see how this makeup of that gene uh, functions. Now, you can go a little bit more designerly, a little bit more artistically. This is also one gene, but uh, with all the text listed in a specific font. It's a font of four pixels wide, four pixels high, and the gene is, is, is made up out of four different enzymes, which is normally represented by T, a C, and A, or a G. And here, this uh, designer called Ben Fry is just listing this. So from very far away, it looks like a gray mass. If you come closer, which we could say that's interaction, you can see the amount of information. And that's just one gene. That's not your whole genetic makeup, but it's one gene. I, I don't know. I think you have 30,000 different genes in your body, uh, in each of your cells. And then there, you can see some um, highlighting. If it's highlighted, it has some functionality. If it's just gray, it's sort of what, what they call garbage. It's not, they don't really know what the function of, of that is. So you can kind of make up and make up your own uh, opinion about you know, the, the efficiency of, of DNA and these sort of things. One step further is, is translating these four enzymes into colors, red, green, blue, and, and, and white. And um, this is website, DNA Rainbow, where you can get a whole, you know, your whole DNA structure. You can download them as GPEGs made out of you know, each pixel is one 
uh, enzyme in your DNA. And you can see, for instance, here that there's a lot of more red. Here you can see also a lot, a lot more red. And for me, this is already kind of exciting. You know, you, you, you know, I told you this is DNA. I could also, I also told you that this is random. And that if it is random, you would not actually look at this anymore, I think. But because I tell you this DNA, I guess everybody is getting quite curious, you know, what is happening here? Is this, is this really random? Or is there a reason why the color red is so predominantly there? And that's because we are kind of trying to read into this uh, visually. Um, you can go more artistic, even with DNA. This is a clock that counts down every second one enzyme, and you need about 130 year, years to do that. You know, what is the insight there? What is the amplification of cognition there? I would say just to get you an idea of the size of information that is, is, that is present in each of our cells. If you need 130 years to go parse through it in each of single of our cells, that's kind of amazing uh, sort of data quantity. And I guess there is no really more insight there than that. Um, you can get more artistic. You, there's a companies out there that when you send them some bodily fluid and you pay them, you can get a painting back of your own, you know, your own identity. It takes a part of your DNA that, that is different for each person, so you have like a unique painting that is sort of yourself, an abstract identity of, of yourself. So if you get up in the morning, you actually kind of look at yourself in sort of a weird way. Um, you can use this sort of data as a random data set. You know, like my students use a, a random function in their programming then I wonder, you know, why do you need that? There's a lot of random data sets around. So this is a carpet that instead of randomness, it tries to map these four enzymes into different movements and so in this sort of pattern, which then for me makes this carpet interesting. If it would be random, I would not be that interested. But there's a lot of you know, pseudo randomness around as data that you can use for your, um, you know, for your programming. Then I'll, I'll show you this one. It's um, a website that, that creates uh, visualizations that look like DNA. You can type in any URL, and then it will generate this sort of DNA-like uh, representation. You can change the color if you want. If you look more like red, it will look like red. Um, you can have different. I haven't tried this. El Pai, do you write it like this? No, it doesn't work. I think it only works with .com. Um, New York Times. There you go. Now, to, to kind of shorten the talk, I, I can already kind of tell you what it tries to visualize. It tries to visualize the HTML structure of that website. So um, the more uh, elements are inside, the more of the lines you will see, the brightness has to do with images and flash elements and this sort of thing. So it's kind of an abstract representation, the identity of the homepage of this website. And my question to you is like, who is sort of feels interested in that, like would like or wrote down the URL and, and would like to spend a little bit of time and, and putting in their own websites or, or websites that you have in mind that you want to compare. Is anybody find this intriguing or could you put up your hand to if you if you feel interested in this sort of thing, sort of artistic thing, or is it too far of your of your bed? Only one person. Mm -hmm. yeah. Or are there more people? It's, well, I'm not, even, I'm not even asking if you understand. I guess you get the idea if you type a URL in there that it gives a visual representation of that URL. And even that, do you, do you find that intriguing? Would you like to find out what it actually is? I mean, there's more questions. That's one of my but would you take time to do that? Or would you find it too, too far artistically? OK, OK. Well, you're the most critical audience until now, because eh? I'm showing this normally quite, quite often. And it's, it's quite very popular if you, um, not even popular anymore, but it's actually so popular that, that people are submitting screenshots of, of these representations. And for me, that's kind of amazing. You know, you're the only victim here, so I won't ask you. Um, everybody's very serious. Um, but I find it amazing that, that, that people want to spend time and want to put websites in to just get a representation like this which is the HTML structure. If you want to know the HTML structure, you can just look at the, the HTML code, if that's really your interest. It sort of hides data. It's not, really, it's not really useful. It doesn't really have a function. Still, you know, thousands of people, hundreds of thousands of people, millions of people go there or have gone there. You know, now it's sort of old um, and, and created these sort of representations. And that's kind of, for me, it's kind of amazing. If you can, with useless visualization, um, get people engaged, can't we use visualization for a better goal? Okay. Make them aware of health issues, sustainability issues, of, of issues that maybe are in your area. Um, 
and, and that's where you know, the aesthetics comes into play. I think the aesthetics here is, is a big role, you know, just because it looks beautiful. It doesn't look like it comes from a book in economics. Don't want to um, complain, but, but it, it, people want to, and want to engage with it, feel that, that it's about, about them. And then there is another, another kind of uh, aspect for that. Uh, um, I think you, with data visualization, you can really make an influence in terms of, for instance, telling a story or creating emotions. So a few years ago, there was an anniversary of the Iraq war, and every newspaper in the United States uh, showed the casualties in Iraq. For instance, you can show casualties like, like this. It, it, it shows, oh, this is Af Afghanistan, it's the same for Iraq, um, where people died and, and, and how they died. Um, the Washington Post showed a bar graph of how many people died in each year. Um, the BBC had like a dashboard of, of where people died, uh, what army they were, what rank, what age, what gender, and this sort of thing. It looks like almost like a performance, you know, like, like a machine that, that you're visualizing. You're, you're not connecting with, actually, these are people that are dying. Some try to do, I think, a much better job in that. This is made um, by Stamen for, for CNN. It also has a lot of data graphics in there, and it's also about casualties. You can see here on the bottom um, different, the different sort of statistics. And you can see it sort of going up, not going down, not going better with the war. But what you can also can do is you can start to zoom in and see where those people come from, which maybe now it's meaningless, but I think even Spain is also included. So you can actually see uh, people from, from Madrid, and now it becomes more personal. I think people are more engaged because you know, you know, might, you might know the person or not. You can see, uh, I click there, where that person died, who he is, it has a name, normally has a picture. Not only that, you can socially engage with that. You can try, you can add memories, you can add comments to that. Each person has a uh, unique URL, you can tweet, you can, you can share this sort of thing. So here these casualties become, you know, stories, become people. And, and I think that there is a lot of uh, power of data visualization there where, where um, you're going a bit further than just showing statistics, but, you, but you're trying to give it a meaning as well. And aesthetics, and I'm not talking just, when I say aesthetics, I'm not talking only about beauty, but it's also interaction, the storytelling, the, the how you can engage people with it uh, is very important in this. Artists are also very good in that, in, in provoking emotion. So this is actually also showing um, casualties. It's a, a robot on the top, it's a Lego robot that drops candies, <laughs> sweets, every time the software finds a casualty in, on the home page of a news agency. So um, you can imagine when you're there in a gallery or in a museum, you're waiting until one of those candies drops down. You hear a noise, bzz, 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 and you see these candies fall down. And then you feel sort of happy that you have experienced this because most of the time this installation is doing nothing. But actually while you're feeling happy that you're experiencing this, actually you are happy because people died in the news. So it's sort of a trick. Um, that you see often in, in art, this duality and, uh, of, uh, of emotions, this, this putting the emotion side to you as a viewer instead of to the designer that tries to, you know, with dramatic images of dead people, tries to convey that emotion here, tries to play with that in a very simple gesture. And I want to show you that, that, that art is, is very good in, in uh, playing with these emotions. Like another good example, if you think about numbers, uh, this is an artwork where each person in the world is actually one corn of rice. And then you can try to show statistics. And this is the population of Australia, for instance. Um, and these guys are um, adding statistics the whole time. They're looking on Wikipedia and encyclopedia. And the whole time, they are taking these mountains away, putting new mountains there. And, and by making it physical, and I will talk about physicality later in the talk, um, it becomes much more real. And this is a weird thing that, that with physicality we have a, a better um, way of comparison than when I would have showed a bar graph. If I say one pixel versus you know, 10 million pixels, it wouldn't have uh, the same effect. These are the guys continuously creating new, new statistics. So what I want to show you, kind of trying to bring these things together, that you can do storytelling, that, that visualization can have uh, a social impact, not only you know, a scientific impact. And uh, I'm trying to kind of show you different ways how visualization can be uh, socially related, and I'll try to do that with, with examples. And hopefully at the end I can try to show some of our research where we try to bring it a little bit further. Um, visualization, of course, can have a social relevance, so it can show data that is, that is you know, relevant for everybody of us. You can show where journalists have died. You know, these are just numbers, but putting on a map, you can sort of relate to that. 
Um, politics is very good in, in trying to convey your numbers. This is a, a, um, a graph in 2010 uh, that Obama uh, was, was showing. And it showed like, you know, how bad it was going under Bush and how go well it's going under Obama. But basically what, it, what, it, what is it showing is that the number of unemployment, unemployed people, the rise of the, uh, of, the, of the increase of the unemployed people is decreasing. So it's on a, on a second degree statistics. There's still people getting more and more unemployed, but the rate with, with, with that number is rising is actually diminishing. That's what it's trying to show. But, you know, it's a nice graph. It's a V-shape. They did, you know, normally bar chart is the other way around. And it gives you the feeling of, you know, it's going very, very well. So even with, with, with data charts, you can play with the data so much that, you know, you can read in it whatever you want. And then you can play if you're a good designer that, that people uh, will see that's actually quite positive. Data charts in that sense have kind of getting a more and more important meaning. And this is from the movie An Inconvenient Truth, which probably is one of the biggest drivers behind the whole sustainability and climate change movement right now. And how do you convey to people that there is a correlation between CO2 emission and temperature? And this is showing 200,000 years of, of temperature measurements and CO2 measurements. And in the movie, you can see what's actually what will happen if we don't do anything in the next 50 years. This is a CO2 emission. And it gives you that sort of dramatic sense of, whoa, we have to do something immediately. Very smartly in that, in that film, they're not only showing data charts, because data chart is still very far of people's comprehension. They show like pictures of, of icebergs uh, falling and, 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 and then the, the water rising and, and deserts and sort of thing. These are pictures that we as human beings can have a better understanding with, but they, they, have, they need data to sort of prove of what, what they say. And this open data, of this, this data uh, is getting more important under Obama. I guess you all know that, you know, he, he made the directive that all the data from the government must be open and free and, and readable in an in a easy accessible format. So this website, data.gov, where you can download all sorts of data, um, you know, that is not going through the SQL service. Um, the UK is jumping on that bandwagon very, uh, you know, very aggressively. You know, the US now, they're, they're trying to scrap more and more of their budget. This will probably will be dropped or will be diminished a lot through the, through the crisis. Uh, Australia is doing this sort of thing. And you see in Europe, it's getting more and more important traction as well. To give you like an example, after the, the disaster in Fukushima in Japan, I was just curious. A few days later, I was trying to look for nuclear plants in the US. And in two, th three clicks, I actually accessed the data of all the nuclear plants in the US, where they're based, what is their ca capacity, uh, how many kilowatt hours do they produce? How, how much percent of that is being used? And sort of thing. So if you're a journalist, for instance, or if you're a concerned citizen, you can actually start looking uh, for that data very easily, you know, putting this, the data in people's hands. Now, of course, just putting this data out is not the end. It's sort of the beginning. You, you, you have to, if you want to think about having people to engage with it, visualization is one of the easiest means of doing this. So this is, for instance, a, a representation by um, the, New, the New York Times of Obama's proposal how to spend or decrease the spend, uh, expenditure of the United States government by 3.7 billion. This is a kind of a typical way. It's kind of a, a tweet chart. And the more red um, one of those rectangles is, the more that will be saved. So there will be a lot of saved in defense military, but there will be a not, oh wait, what did I say? Military construction. But there will be actually this, what is it? Operation and maintenance will increase. Uh, labor is one of the biggest uh, lose, etc. So you can try to interact with that data in that way. As a data geek, I find this interesting. I'm not sure whether a normal citizen finds this interesting. You know, looking at this abstract representation, it looks still very uh, specialized, very expert. Now, um, yeah, UK is showing this as well. Maybe if you in the business school are interested in that, so you can you can engage with this sort of data graphics. You can see for your area for uh, whether it's spending more or less in specific areas, whether it's spending more for environment, spending more or less for military than than the average. So you can try um, to get a better view overview of of how your government is actually what sort of action, what where their uh, attention is is being uh, put maybe emailing those, those politicians and asking you know, what's happening and stuff like that. What I find int interesting more is that it's still, you know, you can show as many statistics as you want, bar charts as you want. People will still have, I think, um, problems with, with comprehending what it, what it actually means. And this is another one of uh, the New York Times, where it actually tries to put 
the decisions of Obama in your hands. What would you like to do to save 3.7 billion um, trillion dollars? So here you have a whole list of possible uh, policies, and it's up, up to you to kind of choose. Uh, you know, I want to reduce the tax for employer-provided health insurance. I think the retirement age should be going from to 70. Um, what else? What is there? Capital gains and dividends. So I can add, and I can actually see how much savings, uh, the savings that I make, and how much of that would actually mean a tax increase and not. And I find it very interesting that you try to empower a normal citizen to deal with this data, because now the person will have to think about, you know, why I just did the uh, in retirement um, age, that was like huge, you know. That was like an, an enormous amount of billions of dollars versus other things that I find maybe very important, medical malpractice, it's very little that that, that would uh, save, or at, at least that their modeling tells, tells you that it, that it will save. So it gives me, I think, because I'm engaging with it and I'm really trying to see what that um, policy measure means, I guess a bigger meaning than just passively looking at data graphics and trying to look for, for correlations there. But that's sort of my opinion of storytelling. What I, what I also see is that, is that more and more cities are trying to follow this um, movement of opening data. Toronto is one. London is very aggressively, again, doing this sort of thing. Data, um, San Francisco is one of the first cities that were opening their data, all sort of data, you know, the cleanliness of, of the streets, uh, what cars there are, the um, criminality. This is, for instance, showing all the trees in San Francisco, where there are. Um, what sort uh, of, of tree it is. And then you can then make, think about visualizations that look like this, where it shows all the criminality in San Francisco categorized. So you can add, you know, make a bigger um, time scale, get into problems right, right there. But you can think like, okay, robbery, where should I not want to go with my wallet? Um, where are all the drunk people? Um, where is the red district in, in um, in San Francisco, etc. At the same time, I think th these sort of visualizations also have, have a danger in them. Eh? So if, if people look at this, they will all say, you know, um, I will never want to walk over here. This is, this is way too dangerous. But at the same time, what is missing, that this is actually downtown San Francisco. So that's where all, all the people are. This is like Playa del Sol or Playa Mayor here. You know, logically, if you have hundreds of thousands of people passing there every day, there will be more crimes. So there's a danger in that as well, opening this data, putting visualizations up, and, and people might misunderstand this data as thinking, like, this is a very dangerous neighborhood. Well, no, it's just a very dense neighborhood. Uh, so um, there is a responsibility there for visualization people to, to um, convey this information in a more truthful way. This is a visualization, I'm not sure if I, if, if I can have time to kind of show each, each one of them, um, where a person was mapping all the playgrounds in, in New York, so when you have a baby, if you have children, you can start looking, you know, where should I live if I want to um, be close by a playground. You can think about looking up the empty spots and maybe proposing local council to put a playground there. You can, you know, have uh, people, normal um, citizens, try to engage and try to ha have action. This example is a nice one where you can try to combine different data sets with each other and make something that is valuable. So imagine you are uh, working at the BBC in the middle of London and you don't want to live very close by because then, then you, you're working uh, long hours. You don't want to live very uh, far away. You want to have a maximum commute of one hour. Now, if you have a data set of public transportation, you can estimate about where you should be able to live. Now, you do, if you're looking for a house, you don't want to live in a dump. You didn't win the lottery. so. Um, you have a specific price range, and now you can start to look for, okay, if you want to uh, own a house, if I want to buy one, I should actually go in those regions that are still wide. And this is a combination of two data sets that maybe are not very obvious immediately, but actually if you do that, you, it creates some value. You can think about creating an iPad app or something, ask one error of it. The point here is that if you open up this data, um, you might create a new sort of industry sort of a business where we don't even know exactly what sort of applications will develop, but because this data is available, people will hopefully think about new, new ways of combining them and creating value. So that's sort of a, an interesting thing in and by itself. All right. Another hot topic right now is, is the visualization of, of your identity. I guess we all know Facebook, where it's sort of a mirror of your physical reality. If you go somewhere, if you have a friend in <laughs> physical reality, you can add them here. If you go to a pub, you add it. If you feel bad, you can add it there. 
Um, but there's also something like I would call a virtual identities, your, the, all, everything that is available of yourself online. So I'm doing something artistic. I will try to look for um, myself. There's an application by the MIT Media Lab that tries to uh, scrape everything it can find about me and then try to visualize this in different categories. I guess I have to try it again. Normally it's much faster than this. Okay, here we go. So by these different categories, online, travel, education, religion, musical, art, it tries to look for, for uh, specific websites, um, their content, and then semantically, it tries to combine them. So I not only have a physical presence, I also have a presence online, and what people write about me or what you know, people are tweeting about me, these sort of things create sort of another identity. And this is not surprisingly also showing sort of a DNA-like representation of, of that. It's more like an artwork. It's not really that you can really learn something from that. Soon I think it will show illeg illegal stuff and things like that. I don't know exactly what that will show. Um, but I guess there's another identity that's coming more and more important, and that's sort of these, your, um, your data traces. So we have more and more sensors, like an IQ+, Plus. we have a mobile phone with a GPS and a motion sensor that, that, that can follow us the whole time. We have these sort of loyalty cards in supermarkets that, that tracks what we're buying. It gives you sort of another sort of trace, a trace that is dispersed in all sort of databases, but it's also some, it also tells a lot about us. I'm sure the CIA, etc. is very interested in that because it can give you a picture of, of who you are. And in, um, in Hollywood, kind of the you want to represent this like this in this movie, uh, Stranger Than Fiction. Imagine that we can trace everything about us. Eh? Uh, when do we uh, brush our teeth? Uh, how do we um, make our tie? How many little dots are on our tie? How long does it take to go for us to the bus? How many words did I uh, speak? Um, what did I eat? How many steps did, did I st make? And, uh, you know, it seems that there is sort of a, a curiosity in, in, our, in, our, um, in our cells that, that has kind of wants to notice. I'm not saying everybody, but you see that people are getting more and more interested in that. And it's getting more a reality. It's kind of an example of uh, Microsoft Research, which sell this camera. And it takes a picture every 30 seconds. So you get um, sort of a recording of your life. You, you, you can think about if you want to remember something that you said or seen it, you seen it one week ago, you could actually go back and, and, and check it out. Of course, it's used in research to kind of follow people and, and see what their habits are, who they, they travel. But you know, the technology of this is extremely cheap. In principle, we could have a camera um, and, and follow us the whole time and a microphone. It's just a question of having enough serve, uh, well, storage space and then have an interface on top of that that we can actually search around if we want to look back what we have eaten last week or who did the wash, washing up last week, was it my girlfriend or me, we, could, we can look back and check it out. You get more and more uh, websites like that that tries to um, help you visualizing this, how many coffee did you eat every day, uh, what sort of pants did you uh, had on, what is a shirt color. This is another one by, by Flowing Data, which uh, uses Twitter to do that. So you can just tweet something and, 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 it, and it will automatically track this for you. This is um, maybe the best known one. I hope there will be a good example here, just clicking around, data. And the people who actually built this are now being, uh, very recently, they moved to Facebook. So you can think of Facebook getting very interested in this, creating data graphics of, of your habits. Um, so what is this person uh, showing? Like, you know, what sort of muse movies did he watch? What sort of music did he listen to? And it creates sort of a homepage, a Facebook page, but based on your data, on your data traces, in, in a sense. And you know, that's kind of all fun, and I want to show you this example. But for me, it's kind of really showing the big potential of, of this sort of thing. It's a website for, for patients, patients that are, in this case, quite seriously ill. And people who have um, depressive disorders, uh, MS, Parkinson's, um, sleep apnea, whatever, HIV, very, you know, um, serious cases of people, of, of people that are ill. What they actually do here is they allow you to create a profile. And for instance, this person you know, um, lives in, in Texas, is 37 year old, even a picture. And that person is actually giving all her medical information freely available. Yeah, you can look um, when she had a relapse, how her pro progression rate is going. I'll go back to that, what her treatment is, what sort of medical 
um, things she's taking and how much, since when, um, how she feels, what are our um, th symptoms, you know, does she have pain behind her eyes, did she have a headache, uh, you can follow her weight, etc., etc. So these people, and I, the sort of an answer, maybe people will ask me then at the end of the talk, you know, what's about privacy? These people give up complete privacy. It's about health. But what you can do now is these people can help each other. You can, you can look, for instance, this graph is showing the normal progression rate <coughs> of that health, uh, of that disease. So she did actually much worse than the average person in her case because she actually was dropping. So she can see that if you have Parkinson's, for instance, you know that there's a 50% chance that, that you will progress in this way, that you will lose specific functions. You can map it now. You can see whether you're doing better or worse than the average. You can try to compare your medicine treatment with, with, with those of others and see you know, of the, if the symptoms kind of uh, became different, whether the, the weight became different and these sort of things. So and visualization here, I guess, is, is, is very, um, and a very important conduit to do this. Let me show another one. Uh, no data there. So imagine we can do this with our you know, shopping habits, with our energy usage, with our, with our water usage. If we can share and if we can compare, and I can see your water usage, and I can compare it with, with mine, and I can uh, have a lesson, you know, why, you know, I, I can't. I can't compare it with somebody else because I don't know your bill. I don't know your situation. So I think there's some added value, and people are actually willing to give up privacy if they can, give, if they can get something back by aggregating everybody's data. All right. Then a very obvious ones, visualization of social activity. I'm not going very deep here because I guess most people know this. You know, Twitter, uh, visualizing what's happening on Twitter um, or even in, in specific uh, frames like uh, football and when there's a match you can see what people are, are tweeting about or when there's an MTV um, program you can see, you know, this was a, a moment in time when Kane West was jumping on a, on a podium and took away I think her award or something. You know, the amount of tweets goes up. And I guess there the, the biggest motivation is that you know, this social activity is sort of it's something invisible. And if you're a hip company like MTV or Coca-Cola or Nike or something, you want to show that people are talking about your brand. And their visualization is sort of that, that interface that opens up for everybody that you know, people are talking about you. So interesting, but not very interesting. What I find uh, more interesting is, is visualizations that try to look for knowledge, look for insight, where actually um, the data not naturally will, would provide you that. But uh, let me maybe explain with an example. For instance, Google is following the word flu and is tracking where people are looking for the word flu in the US. With their IP number, they know about the IP number and they know in which state that is. So if you do that, if you're Google, you can actually see the flu coming into the US and progressing from the East Coast to the West Coast just by looking when people are looking for the word flu. There's a lot of noise. I'm sure people will look for flu you know, when there is no flu epidemic, but that's much, much more less than actually the real thing where uh, they do that. So you can actually predict when there's an epidemic coming, not by going to doctors, but by looking to a search engine, which I find kind of intriguing. You can look to the weather, not by looking to a satellite, but by looking how people are tweeting. So if you're trying to look for snow, rain, uh, these sort of keywords. So rain is, for instance, here blue. I think uh, hot is, is here, let's say, brown. I'm not fully sure, but just for the sake of the argument, you can see that it's raining very, very much around New York. So you don't need a satellite anymore if you can follow uh, the, the Twitter streams. Of course, only maybe 1% of people are actually tweeting about the weather, but that's still 100,000 people. You can look and, and see how people are traveling. So this is a, an artist who was uh, following tweets that have the words just landed. So normally people they tweet and say, just landed in Madrid. So my profile of Twitter says Brussels. I says just landed in Madrid. So what does this visualization do? It will draw a line between Brussels and Madrid. So you almost have a real-time view of people traveling. Privacy-wise, you also have a real-time view of when people are not home. But you know, people do that. We talk about privacy, people have no problem saying I'm in Madrid. And uh, if I would live alone, my house would be empty right now. So it's kind of an interesting um, way of looking at data that is actually not meant to show travel, but you can actually do that through a social discussion. This is an interesting one. I guess most of you might know that because it's actually the case of Spain where uh, the MIT Sensible City Lab 
was analyzing the pictures taken in Spain. Now, if you have all the pictures taken in Spain, you can look about, you know, um, where do people take pictures in the evening? Where do they take pictures in the morning? Where are the pictures that are green, that probably are forests? Um, where do people uh, that are from Spain take pictures versus those that are from the US? How do they experience the cities differently? And this kind of this is just an animation, but you can actually look how people perceive Spain through the pictures that are being stored on Flickr by aggregating and looking at, at keywords. This is, for instance, a, a, draw, um, a map of San Francisco again, where the red color are the tourists, the blue color are the locals, the, pur the purple color are the, are the, we don't know. And you can see how tourists move about uh, San Francisco and how local people. This is the one of, of Madrid uh, that I could find. I'm not sure, I guess you guys are more local. This seems to be a very tourist spot over there. I'm not sure what that is. There seems to be a lot of local pictures over there. I was trying to look for it on Google Maps, but I couldn't find it. You can think about, you know, this is just a, a social phenomenon. How do people perceive a city like Madrid? You can think if you are in a traffic uh, agency, uh, how to optimize these, these sort of traffic flows. If you're in the tourism industry, you can say, well, we have a very nice monument there. You know, why is nobody going there? You could, you could look at this data in a very different way without going on the street and interviewing people, just taking their pictures. This is how Rome is perceived by Italians. And this is how Rome is perceived by Americans. Yeah. And you can think Americans are stupid, but maybe they all have the same book or something. Um, and is it the prob maybe it's, it's good for, you know, the term in the tourist industry finds it good, but if they see this, and maybe it's bad, because actually they would, you know, for the industry it would be good if they would disperse a bit. Well, here is the data, you just look at their pictures. All right. You could add data there, you could follow people, you could have a stress meter. This is, a, this is an, old ex an old example, but this is actually me measuring the stress, people running around in a city, and then you can have, um, you can show, for instance, how specific spots in a city are, are more stressful. And you can think about as an urban planner, you know, how we can deal with, with noise, with pollution, and things like that. Sometimes visualization is also a good conduit to create. So this is actually um, a map that was updated after the Haiti uh, earthquake. There was no good map available. Only the US in, uh, military had a good map, but they didn't want to give it out. Google did not have a good map. So OpenStreetMap uh, asked people, they, they had satellite pictures, and they were asking people, you know, take a picture, here is the map, now update it yourself. Now, within a week, they had an updated map of Haiti together with all the positions of the, the, the refugee camps. And there, you know, the visualization was the end result. Um, and helping you know, NGOs and Red Cross and stuff like that, and it still, still exists. You can still actually see where the refugee camps are uh, based on uh, satellite pictures. Okay, kind of a, an, another alternative for that is people trying to make accurate maps. So if you have a bike and you live in, in New York what you, and you, you want to know where you, you can store your bike, because sometimes you want to go to a shop but you don't know where to store your bike. I'm not sure uh, why it isn't showing here. Maybe I have to show it to, to, to the graph. So it shows you a map of all the bike racks where you can store the bike. And then you, what you can add is you can add a picture. You can say whether it's a safe uh, bike, if it should be replaced. You can, uh, you can even uh, ask the council for, you know, this is a good spot where I would like a bike rack. Could you please put one? People can vote for it. If you have 100 people that all want a bike rack there, maybe the local council will put one there, sort of opening up this sort of uh, an interface between local council and, and people. You know, and people get engaged by this. People are really um, wanting to um, add and create, for instance, an, an accurate map. Then the last one is sort of the recent phenomenon, which for me was kind of amazing a few years ago, where they, some people want to empower lay people to use sophisticated data visualization tools. Lots of people have data at home or about their council or about their hobbies, and they don't know how to visualize it. They know Excel, and that's about it. What tool would you otherwise use? So this is a, a website by uh, IBM that, that has all these different visualization techniques. It allows you to, to generate it. Um, you just upload your data, and then you, have this, you can choose what, what uh, data technique you are, visualization technique you're using. People can comment on it. It's like, it's like YouTube. Can can look at uh, things that are might be not accurate, or or uh, you want to have these changes, etc. Different, very cool um, techniques. <laughs> it's kind of uh, successful, not successful in, in a way that we don't see really a big social community happening around pure data. Seems to be much more potential if you tell more a story about it. You know, bike racks. 
this is more pure statistics. People don't seem to engage around pure statistics. Other experiments in science then where you allow people to annotate a graph, give it meaning by your interpretation, for instance. All right. I guess I still have 10 or 15 minutes. I'll, if you want, I, I can try to show you some, some of the things that, that, that we have tried. And you'll see that, that uh, what, we, what we're trying to do is, is mostly um, trying to get outside of the traditional screen. Um, I personally don't. I like the, the future where, where people will run around in a city li like that, but I think there is much more potential by using the physical reality around us to um, give a context to how data be can be perceived. You know, that we can still engage with, with, with our environment, with the texture, with the color of the city, while, for instance, getting information about that city. I'll try to show you that. So you can make data graphics physical. This is an example of an artwork of all the criminality happening in London. And the highest peak are, for instance, not where you get murdered, but it's all the white crime, uh, you know, the, the financial district. And I think when you, when you go physical, you can get also a better context. You know, what is one ton of CO2? You know, it's 1,000 trees. What is 1,000 trees? Well, it's, you know, 50 cars that are not driving anymore. Well, what is that? If you make it physical, people get, a, you know, I see some now a few smiley faces as well, but, you know, you, you get a more um, way of, of contextualizing um, these abstract numbers. By using a physicality, you also give it immedi immediately a meaning. This is an installation that won uh, quite prestigious prizes that is, that is showing how much energy is saved in the city during that moment. The more energy was saved by the city, the bigger this green uh, spot would be become. And it's actually projected on the steam coming out of an energy uh, factory. So people immediately understand it. You know that it's the energy factory. It, it's, it's lighting up, so it has to do with you know, energy usage. You don't need an extra label or, or graph like that. Um, some people might say, well, you know, that laser beam actually also requires energy. It only required 8 watts. So um, there's the that, that problem I will go uh, at the end. I will talk about it. That when you do things about energy, you, sh you should not use energy yourself. And that's a problem if you think about public displays. There's this sense that data is becoming almost more important than maybe money. Uh, you're not, it's not more maybe important how much money you have, but how popular you are online. How many Facebook friends do you have? How many Google hits do you have? You know, if you, if you could show that in reality, how popular you are uh, on Facebook, while well, you might have no friends in reality, people might want to talk to you. Again, an example of that, that context. You know immediately that that blue and that red means the temperature of that water doesn't need a label. You know, you could also put a temperature number next to it. Why? Color is and, and uh, lighting that, that, that water immediately gives that, that sort of context. This is a nice um, example of a, a power cord that lights up when, when it uses power, when the, the devices that are connected to it are using power. So when you leave your home and that, that cord is still light up, you haven't switched off your television or it's still on standby mode. It doesn't need an extra display. It doesn't need numbers. The cord is, is a representation of energy. Lighting up means it's using energy. It doesn't need that. So we're trying to look for um, these sort of contextual connections to show data in a more intuitive way to people. Um, yeah, that's another one <laughs> of a USB stick, you know, telling you it's full. Uh, you shouldn't add stuff anymore. So one of the first projects that, that we did was um, thinking about the representation of, of, uh, of your behavior, of your life. And we're thinking about folds. Fold is always a an, an result of an action. You know, um, even in, if you see like a bed, you can sometimes see your loved one still, the silhouette in there. These folds are there because there was some movement there. So we created a display that looks like that. And we wanted to create folds, you know, just as clothing. You know, mine is already quite creaked. So, we, so you know, I've done a lot of things today, maybe. Maybe that's what I want to say. So and it shows different states, states of social contact, or how much you moved during the day. Um, and uh, how much you know, in noisy places you have been. And you can see it opening here. At the end, it became quite creepy because uh, we couldn't use motors and stuff yet to do specific things um, to do that. It was also meant to wear the whole day. And we were trying to test out whether people could actually read it after a while, whether your friends could read it after a while where versus people in the bus who you don't want to come to you and say, you had a busy day today, right? No, you, you want uh, to do that. So we made a device that you could actually hide or use as a fashion uh, accessory. And we're trying to see you know, how people would deal with externalizing that information that is normally hidden. This student went a little bit further, was trying to think about, well, can we make a dress 
that is adapting to the stress state of the girl wearing it. So changing the silhouette. In the end, it became also creepy, maybe. Um, this is kind of a testing, you know, what sort of things can, uh, can, can, can change. You know, you often, you know, maybe you might be very nervous if you're going to a specific ball or, or stiff thing here is kind of showing that. In the end, it became creepy, but it was an interesting thing to, to think about cloning, etc. Then we were looking for some killer app, and, and here we tried to think about um, can, can visualization change decisions? So what we were trying to do here was creating a basketball jersey that would light up depending on how many fouls the person has and how good the person is playing. So here on the sides, the, more, the better you're playing, the more the, these lights would light up on the side. And if you're more and more fouls, the more um, lights will, will glow at the top. Because in basketball, you know, if you have three, four uh, fouls, you try to make that person's life impossible because after five, the person has to go. And I play basketball myself, so I know it's, it's, so, it's going so quickly that you only have maybe the statistics of one player, the player you have to defend to, but you don't know the other stuff. Even as a coach, it goes too fast. Uh, and as a spectator as well, you know, who's the best player, who's the worst player, it, it goes too quickly. So we wanted to see how um, these things could work. In reality, we, we deliberately chose girls to, to play with it because we were concerned people would break it and stuff like that. And so we did the investigation, um, um, what the impact was, whether people had a, a better overview. So spectators loved it, coaches loved it, players themselves, they were too engaged. It, it goes even too fast to kind of look at the other players' uh, visualization. And if they did, they were like doing like this, checking whether it, it was correct. So we learned kind of a lot. Still, I still believe in this concept. I think Nike or Adidas should, should um, I think there's a potential there. Um, and it's not that expensive to make as well. Then we were trying to think about what I was talking a little bit about before. Can we put our virtual identity in our physical identity? So when you are a very successful uh, tweet person or blogger, or if you have so many friends online, you can walk around in Madrid and nobody knows you. So can we somehow um, have these sort of statistics <laughs> into physical reality and maybe see how people react to that? So what we made was called Twitter earrings. The idea is that um, a girl wears his earrings, goes into a pub or a bar, uh, meets somebody. Um, you ask the, that person's Twitter handle. You put these um, earrings on your iPhone. And with a an, with an, uh, simple uh, light sensor, you can, uh, you know, the, the iPhone figures out statistics of, of Twitter. And then you have two bar charts. So the red one, which is you, and the green one, which is the other person. And a girl could wear that as a sort of statistical comparison of your popularity online. Sort of um, basic idea prototype <laughs> that we tried to make. And this is, you know, again, very simple. Right? Um, it's made in a week or so. Then we tried to think, well, can we have more um, resolution there? So we were thinking, uh, yes, maybe we can project to the ceiling. The ceiling is sort of uh, a surface that is uh, mostly empty anyway. And the floor is sort of dangerous. <laughs> because there's a lot of things that people can step on it, and stepping on it is sort of a negative connotation. Um, and we took all the statistics from um, Facebook, how many friends you have, what, you were, what your status was, uh, messages, et cetera. And you could interact with it. So it has a compass, so the way you were rotating, if you're rotating to one of those categories, then it would open up and, and would show that data. So we had a little projector. Now they have, you know, projectors are about this size nowadays. Um, sensors and sort of things, and, and, and trying to figure out whether it would actually be useful. Had sort of uh, mixed results. Eh? Even the ceiling, you know, people were all the time looking up to, s to look for something embarrassing to talk about. Um, so um, I guess better would actually have been the wall or have uh, give the person a freedom. But it was an interesting uh, thing to look like. Um, last thing that we sort of environment that we will now are looking at is the urban environment. Um, thinking of, of creating visualizations in the city to kind of give a better overview of the city, trying to persuade people to maybe use more bicycles, use less energy, things like that. So we did first experiments. We had our students making these sensor boxes, and they um, had to attach it to all different things in the city, like how many times are people pressing a button, sort of a phenomenon in Sydney when you want to cross the street, you have to press it. And people, I don't know if you have, people press it a lot of times, sort of that. It's weird. Huh? It's kind of uh, an interaction you do. You think it will go faster by clicking it a lot. It's kind of interesting from an interaction design point of view. How many times are people actually using this sort of thing, and when uh, are they using it? We were trying to figure out the um, traffic situation by just having one sensor on, on the green light and the red light. If you don't know the situation of one red light, you know it all, every, everywhere. Just a simple light sensor. Um, we got into problems with the police quite quickly. 
um, who thought we were like terrorists and attaching these sort of things to the infrastructure. It's a, it's a, it's a weird uh, concept. And the idea was then how can we give that, that data back to citizens? Can we, for instance, tell them something about the difference between the weather and the traffic? So it's, it's a bridge and the, the flowers represent weather and, and the LED lights, which actually are in, inside there, tells you how much traffic there is. You know, people might take the bike more when it's good weather and stuff like that. When you're waiting for the bus, how much pollution are you actually breathing in? So it's kind of a bus stop, and it shows an LED bar graph. Uh, this is showing when the bus is coming, the idea of, of uh, yeah, trying to think outside of a screen that, that we can uh, yeah, show, show wind or, or uh, show motion. This is uh, telling you the situation of the traffic stop of the red light further on that you can't <laughs> see. So a lot of time you're, it's green, you're really driving fast, and then just 100 meters further away it's again red. So if you can inform people a really little bit before, they could estimate, you know, don't drive that, that quickly, CO2 emission goes down. So it's sort of an alternative traffic light that that person made. Um, yeah, trying to think about different ways how to do that. The one of the last project that we did was thinking about alternatives of, of this energy usage um, um, displays. So you can buy them now for 50 euros or something. It measures your energy usage. You can put it in the kitchen or in the in your living room. It's kind of strange. I have one myself. You don't find a spot. You know, you don't want. This is kind of exaggeration, but you don't want to have displays in your living room. You have art and stuff, things you love, and then suddenly there is this, you know, this ugly thing in your living room that tells you how much energy you use. It's kind of a weird concept. Well, what would you like them to put in? But Let's go one step further. If you know the energy in your house, why do you want to keep it within your living room? Would it not be interesting that you could broadcast it to the world and maybe have a pledge and say, I will use 10% less energy, and then showing it to everybody so there's some social pressure. Now, if you do that for one house, your house, maybe your neighbors can join in. The whole street can join in. Streets can, can start to compete against each other. You know, uh, one street says, I want to have 10% less energy use. The other streets, I will do 11%. Or you can try to see how well it goes. You can try to have competitions of neighborhoods. Um, you know, displays that, that might look like that, <coughs> showing the real-time energy uses and water usage, maybe showing that in comparison to, to the average of Madrid or another neighborhood. A problem of that, and I, I already told you that a little bit earlier as well, is like, OK, you show energy usage. You want to save energy, but you're using a display that is actually using energy itself. It's kind of, you, know, you can put uh, solar panels on top, but still, it's kind of a, a hard proposition. So we did some design research, like, OK, if we want to do that, if we want to show energy outside, what do people show outside of their homes? Uh, you have these GNOME things. You know, the more you have them, the better. Uh, Christmas, in Australia at least, people were actually competing to have the nicest Christmas lighting. You have this sort of idea of, of everybody doing it in the street, putting lights out. Well, I have to do it as well. There is that social pressure. And we, we came up with the idea of using a blackboard. A blackboard is cheap. A blackboard you can update. You can, um, so it's actually quite a good display. It has this sort of um, environmentally friendly connotation as well. It, it, you can recycle it quite well. Um, you can show information very well. Like, you know, the difference between uh, a good local coffee shop and Starbucks is that a good local coffee shop is using this sort of technology, and Starbucks is using professional. Uh, lettering and stuff. So it has that sort of common feel and, and neighborhood feel. And of course, you can um, you know, reuse it. So that was the idea. We wanted to have many different houses with about the same size, with about the same distribution of families, and put the energy usage on, on the facade. To make a long story short, we were looking for the research was to see what visualization would go best. You know, just showing that you are number five in the street is not the way to go. You wanted to show so it's some historical things. You wanted to give them rewards, like, sh like flowers, to, to um, induce long-term in, um, change, not only you know, one week because it's cool. In the second week, they forget it. Um, so we did some experiments there, kind of interesting. Um, for instance, in the beginning, we were, we were using smileys. And, and we, we put like a bad smiley on, on somebody's house. And the person immediately said, I don't want to have any negative things on my house. So we had to change, and we had to change the flowers. Um, and this is how, how it, at the end, it, uh, it, it looked like. So yes, then you have different house widths, so we had to design for that as well. This is how it looked like. So each single day, we went to, the, to those houses, climbed the ladder, and added to that data. And that actually by itself became quite interesting. That became an event. People were looking out for the moment that we came, and we were changing the data. And then, they, and then they were so angry that they were lost, they stopped. So you have this competitive 
I mean, social features as well that you have to be careful about. It's also known, for instance, if you show averages, that a good person, a person who uses less energy, will actually try to move, will, will move towards the, the average, will actually become worse. So the, the, you have to watch out by comparing people. Bad people, you know, worse performing people will try to move down, but good performing people will actually move to the average as well. So we try to kind of hide this with different uh, pictograms and things, but there are things you have to be careful about. Yeah, that's my colleague updating the display and some uh, um, technology that, that was involved. All right, it was like a, a broad overview of different sorts of data visualization. That's it. Do you have any questions or maybe to be? Yeah. Uh, I enjoyed the, the lecture a lot. I think it was uh, very great, all the things you showed about your own work. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm curious uh, to see if, if there's any project that is trying actually to track how people uh, react to, to, to the information they get from these visualization projects. Do you know what I mean? Like, uh, so there, there's a lot of projects right now putting um, data in an easier way to understand for people. Yeah. But I think it was very interesting to say, okay, now how do people react to these, yeah. to, to, to these set of uh, more easier or more digestible information and and it, how, does, yeah. how does that actually change uh, the, the, the real environment? Well, it's something you will see, I guess, in the next two, three years. Something that, that, that uh, people are getting more and more at, um, uh, that they will focus on right now, the impact of data visualization. But it's, very, it's a very do difficult topic. In a way, it's easy, for instance, in this project, because we could measure the energy. So we could prove we had five houses with display, <coughs> with five houses without display. So we could prove the impact of the display. But if you don't have like, you know, behavioral changes like this, then what is the impact? So there are different techniques of, 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 of doing that. Um, and I would be curious as well. I'm a little bit skeptical. If you can really prove um, that data visualization is bringing that much more insight. But yeah, how would you, you know, in a way, how can you prove impact when people don't have a task beforehand? If they have a task, you can easily test, you know, you give them a task, how many people live in, in Madrid? Here's a visualization, and they give an answer back. You can measure the time, you can measure how accurate it is. But if people don't have a, a preconceived idea, if they just go to the data visualization to come up with their own questions, it becomes more difficult. But it's a very good question. experimental work of designers and, and researchers, but I think that maybe in the last two years or so you could start saying that there's already an industry. Uh, we start having big conferences, uh, more and more uh, competition, you could say, both in companies and also in tools. So do you think there is such a thing, or there's gonna be a space for such a thing as a visualization industry? Um, and what is the sectors and the areas in which it's going to prove that it can add value? Yeah. I have, the, I have the feeling there's an industry, yes, and it's coming up. I have more and more friends who actually stop with their day jobs and starting to open up a visualization studio because it seems to be, you know, lots of companies seem to have data and they say, oh, do something with it. The next question is if they will actually give money for it. Often it's like, is data, can you visualize it for us? And they don't. If you can prove there is a value and money is, can be translated into money, I guess you have a business model. Um, and in, and in what industries, like I think, I guess the most easy industry would be, you know, governmental or things like where, or companies that, that have to make yearly bro, uh, reports or have money to communicate to the population. So they have bu budgets anyway to, to communicate somehow their, their business. Um, if, I guess that sort of budgets are already there that they don't have to create new ones. That's where, where I would see uh, things happening. On the other side, my ideal business model would be um, asking data, um, visualizing it for free. And if you find an insight and you can go back to the company and say, I found something that will save you 10 million, 
then you ask you know 20% of that. <laughs> but I'm, I'm not seeing that, that, that business model. But if visualization would be really doing you know what it claims it does, cre creating insight where it was none before, that could be a business model. Like okay, we do it for free, and if we find something useful, we will not tell you unless you sign a contract giving us a part of that money. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, um, I have the feeling that there will be a consensus within now and, and, and two years. Like the European Commission is getting more and more interested in, in, in this sort of topic because they are running behind the United States, for instance. And I don't know where they can draw the border. I know like criminality rates is something that no, no government or local council wants to give out. Although it's strange, why not? What you know? It, it's uh, what are they afraid for? Or wh where would you draw? Or where would you draw the line? I don't know. Do you have an idea? Of, of I, I think it's, uh, it will be defined uh, on the way. Yeah. Because, uh, for instance, uh, the crime, or because I'm thinking, I'm figuring out uh, how to use this data to to overcome problems with. Uh, Did these things exist eh? yeah, in the United States? I guess in the European model, you try to hide this sort of data, like you know, um, restaurants inspections. In the US, it's open. You, you can, you know, it's an inspection today, you can read it about it tomorrow on the website. In, in Europe, you, know, you don't want to offend the restaurant owner, which is a different <laughs> sort of model. So in, in the councils feel the same way. Official data, maybe the, the yeah. way to, you can use uh, official data. Yeah. And, uh, just Yeah. Yes, and that's a lot of scientists are very, very skeptical in that. So one of the categories I showed that, that people could create uh, own visualizations, and then you know things might be showing they might show things that are not true, and that's where as a scientist you're often also afraid of. But you know I don't know in this world it's uh, yeah I know. But it, I'm not telling you, but a lot of scientists are sort of very critical that, that normal people would get access to that data and then you know, use statistics, whatever they, they think of, and prove you know, climate change is actually false. And that's actually happening. Eh? People are proving it's false based on some data, but doing the wrong, uh, the wrong way. But yeah, there's always disadvantages on, on, on being transparent. I would hope you know, that the, the data would, would become open. Yeah. They were young couples, young, young, I think what, what we ended up with was young alternative couples. For instance, we had no problem with privacy. We expected big problems with privacy. You could see when they did the showering, you could see when they were doing the washing, but they were all sort of, they were, I think they were already sort of green, in, in the, you know, green-minded. Um, that, that's what, so most of them were like young people living together, yeah. 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 No. 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 Designers. Most of them were designers and computer scientists. Yeah. Yeah. 
that's that's um, what it has to do with, with with practice. We got a very small grant. I think this is done with less than ten thousand euros or something, and we had to do it very, very rapidly. Yes, we we could. We we used some sort of social science interview techniques in the beginning to see how people live and what their value was about sustainability and what um, uh, how they describe these visualizations. We we did do that. Yeah, but it was more like. Um, yeah, I think we, we learned a lot in, out of the visualization per perspective. You know, one, one thing is that uh, yeah, people only look to this line graph. The rest that went, went by, like these this, this smileys and stuff, they didn't care at all. And they were reading things in there, actually showing sh change. And they, they all thought it was uh, <coughs> real usage. And we were doing a, a normalized graph of change out of privacy concerns. So things that I learned, for instance, very hard is like, you know, people have this fixed mental expectation, and you cannot go against it. They, they will uh, add a value. They will interpret it their way anyway. We, can, we, we told them so many times it means this, not that, and they keep on going with what they thought it was, which is logical. But as a designer, it's not something that you find logical. Sort of, you know, it, you open the door this way, and people will always open the door in another way, you know, th in the right way, actually. You know. Don't know. Okay, so it's open. No problem.